Welcome everyone to our third webinar in the University of the Sunshine Coast Research Unmasked seminar series. I'm Dr Gemma Reid and I've been part of the organising committee for the series. The aim of the series overall is to provide some information about research and expertise related to COVID-19 from our academics at USC. Before we go on with tonight's session, I'd like to, on behalf of all those participating tonight, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters upon which the university's campuses are located. I acknowledge their continuing connections to country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I recognise that these lands have always been places of learning and teaching for Indigenous peoples. So tonight's webinar is about creating COVID safe environments. After tonight, we will still have two webinars in the series and they'll be covering topics like business resilience and adaptation during COVID-19 and also the wider societal implications of the pandemic. So I'd recommend that you look at those webinars too if you do get a chance. In just a moment, I'll be handing you over to our session facilitator, Associate Professor Amanda Henderson. Um, but there was just a couple of things I'd like to cover about the session um, before I do hand you over. So for those of you who may have joined our previous webinars, You'll know that we're using the Q&A function in Zoom to take questions. Um, you should be able to find that as a button on the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to type in your questions. Now you won't necessarily see other people's questions coming up during the session, but you'll be able to see them as they're being answered. Um, and you can choose to ask your question anonymously if you prefer, so there's a button you can press for that. Um, secondly, you might hear an audible tone during the sessions. Um, this is just something we're using to keep our speakers to time. Um, and so that we have enough time at the end for questions. So now it's my pleasure to hand you over to our session facilitator, Associate Professor Amanda Henderson. Amanda is the Head of School of Nursing, Midwifery and Paramedicine at USC and is a visiting research fellow with the Sunshine Coast Hospital and Health Service. Amanda brings to her role a broad knowledge base spanning nearly 40 years and has held diverse leadership roles across the Australian healthcare sector including clinical health service administration and health service evaluation. Amanda attained her PhD from the University of New South Wales and her research has continued to focus on healthcare delivery reform, consumerism and end of life care. So I'll pass over to you, Amanda, to um, take us forward with the session. Welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. Understanding and creating COVID safe environments is relevant for everyone and this evening our presenters will provide perspectives on infection prevention in healthcare facilities, post pandemic urban design and exploring safety and resilience in public spaces and creating COVID safe environments through literacy in microbiology. Following the presentation has already been um, flagged, we will have time for questions for our presenters. So please post your questions via the Zoom chat as we go. Our first presentation this evening is by Matt Mason. Matt is a lecturer in nursing at the University of the Sunshine Coast and is the program coordinator in the Bachelor of Nursing Science and Bachelor of Nursing Science graduate entry degrees. Matt has experience across a range of clinical nursing roles. He is credentialed as an expert um, through the Australasian Co College for Infection Prevention and Control and is the convener of the Australasian College of Infection Prevention and Co Control for lower middle income country specialist interest groups and a member of the Education Committee. He also consults with the World Health Organization Global Outbreak and Response Network. Matt will be speaking tonight on infection prevention in healthcare facilities. And I would like to hand over to you now, Matt, um, for your presentation. Thanks, Amanda. Welcome everyone this evening and thanks for coming on at this time of the evening. Um, so my expertise is in outbreak management, particularly in resource limited settings. And one of the things that we've seen over this pandemic is the is an is a lack of understanding of what infection prevention and control actually is. And there's been quite a bit of a focus that it's all about star, uh, patient um, safety. And in fact, the World Health Organization um, definition includes the health and safety of both the people who use services and those who provide them. And it is much broader than that, in fact. The core components here talks about the acute healthcare facility level, but infection prevention and control is an integral part of all healthcare that we do, whether it's in a hospital, in a GP centre, um, wherever you think that there's healthcare being delivered, then infection prevention and control is happening for the safety of everyone involved. 
So I thought tonight before I started talking about how we can make them safe, we need to have a bit of an understanding on what helps COVID-19 to spread. So this um, diagram is from a paper that is looking at broad community spread of, um, of how COVID gets around. But it is relevant to the healthcare um, setting and it's really relevant to infection prevention. So if we have a think about our environment, most healthcare is delivered in an indoor environment and potentially where ventilation is not as good as it could be. A lot of older health services in fact do better um, because they are open and we can open the windows. But here in, in Australia, we've actually sealed up our buildings a bit and ventilation is, is mechanical. And so one of the things that we need to look at um, down the track in, in our um, ways of limiting the spread is to look at ventilation broadly um, in health services. If you look at host factors, so the, the you know the people who can get ill, um, then those who are very old, those who are very young, those who have high viral loads or very severe illness or have lowered host defence factors tend to get COVID more and tend to spread it more. And they tend to be the people who are in health services as patients. Socioeconomic factors here in Australia are not such an issue about spread in health services, but job insecurity and prolonged working hours are really important. And we've particularly seen that in aged care settings where we have um, aged care workers who work across multiple aged care facilities and have spread COVID from one to the other and to their home. The contact pattern, this um, talks about how much contact you need to have with a, a, an infectious person to catch COVID-19. The closer you are to the index case, the time of contact, the duration and how long that is. So the time of contact is when the patient is infectious or not. The contact frequency and the activities that you're doing. So if you're a healthcare worker, so a, particularly a nurse or a physiotherapist or someone who's working very close with patients on an extended period of time, then the risk of spread to you is much higher um, than potentially it is for, for people out in, in the community. And so the reason we need to know this is because we look at how it's spread to look at how we will actually reduce the risk of transmission in healthcare settings. There are a number of barriers um, to safe healthcare in pandemics. Lack of resources has been a problem. We've had issues with lack of PPE, so personal protective equipment, such as masks, gowns, those sort of things. Uh, misinformation and confusion, uh, where we've had you know, people having their own ideas who may not be knowledgeable in the, in the transmission of the disease. Poor practices are very common, as is inadequate preparation. And, and colleagues of mine uh, at Griffith University, we've done some studies around how we use what we call transmission-based precautions in, in emergency departments. And this is, was before COVID-19. And our study sort of reiterated what had been found around the world globally is that in health services, we tend to not worry about the, um, the, the big things. Uh, if a patient presents into an emergency department, we tend to, uh, with you know, a, a fever and a runny nose, we tend to think of yeah, a, a cold before we think about things like measles or um, chickenpox or even COVID-19. And we're inadequately prepared for when these do turn up and we spread it through our health systems um, fairly quickly. Solid thinking is thinking that, you know, if I am an anesthesiologist, then I only need to listen to anesthesiologists and what they think we should be doing rather than having a whole of team approach to how we manage the spread of uh, a disease within our healthcare services. And particularly with this pandemic, not ke ke keeping up with changes in the literature about how we should manage, treat and prevent the spread of diseases. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about whether our healthcare facilities are usually safe. And a paper, a, 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 an opinion piece came out in Crokey um, yesterday, which had this lovely quote that no healthcare provider sets out to harm their patients, but the systems that they operate in are simply not organised for safety. And this is true. Um, in 1999, the US government uh, report, uh, National Institute of Health put out this report called Two Areas Human. And they, they it, it, that was around errors that led to patient harm. And that was 98,000 patients harmed annually. In 2016, they went back and revisited it and it was over 400,000 patients annually. 
Here in Australia, one in nine hospital patients are harmed by the while getting care in a healthcare facility. So we know that these facil our facilities aren't necessarily safe. And that's been one of the concerns about moving potentially COVID patients from aged care into hospitals, because we know that that is a, a risk in itself, regardless of COVID. So we have this little thing um, called the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. It was launched as an independent statutory authority in 2011. It oversees the accreditation of healthcare services and the settings of, um, of the criteria that we need to meet as, a, as an accredited healthcare um, facility. And they have an integral part of that program is infection prevention and control. It's called standard three um, within the Australian standards. And that's led to in, in much more embedding of infection prevention and control and a whole range of other patient safety activities into the requirements of the day-to-day -day running of health systems here in Australia. So how do we make our um, healthcare services safer in terms of COVID. So there are two things here that, that we wanted to talk about. And one is this up-to-date information is being absolutely vital. The literature that has come out this year on how to be safe as a healthcare worker or as a patient or even just in general in, um, in the world has been immense. And it is impossible to keep up as, a, as one person. So the Australian government has the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force, and that is updated regularly. There's a daily communique that comes out um, that we can access to see what changes there are, and they're living guidelines. So an individual clinician or health service doesn't need to do this work themselves. They can go and get information from here. And the other one is this workplace health and safety approach to safety in the, in, in the workplace. And this is the hierarchy of controls. Now, ideally, elimination is what we want to do, which is physically remove the hazard, which is not going to happen in a pandemic. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line there. So anything that we're doing is at the lower levels of uh, protection. And you can see there at the bottom is PPE. It's the least effective way of making places safer, although it's one of the things that were pushed re really hard early on and still is today. So one of the guidelines that we've used is the um, World Health Organization interim guideline. It's called interim, it was interim in March, it's interim in June and, and it will remain interim until um, COVID's done and dusted. That's just the way the World Health Organization works. But it gives us five main areas that we need to look at in terms of infection prevention and control in health services. The first is looking at the we insure triage. So when a patient attends a health service, we are able to identify whether they are potentially infected with COVID and do source control. Source control in infection prevention um, language is where we try and keep it within that person and to that person. So we would put that person in a mask so they can't cough and spread it around. We then apply standard precautions for all patients and that's our hand hygiene, um, we make sure that if there is any blood and body fluids that we do, um, clean it up appropriately, or if we need to wear gowns because they're coughing, uh, we will put those on. We'll implement additional precautions, which might be isolating and cohorting, and then contact droplet and airborne. And airborne are the ones where you're seeing, we've seen a lot of discussion around whether people should have high level masks. But the ones that we're looking at for, you know, sort of the bang for the buck that we need is these administrative controls where we look at um, how to manage uh, the work environment. Using environmental and in engineering controls is fantastic. That's the ventilation and those sort of things, but they're often not as easy to do as we would like. And it's, and it's something that we need to be a bit more agile on in healthcare. So when we're looking at the administrative controls, we're talking about the detection, the detection and triage of cases. We need to organise them, we need to keep them away. So if we can separate the care of patients and, and some staff, so you roster a team on to care for particular patients and we keep another team off so that if one team gets exposed, you don't lose your whole um, workforce. And the managing of resourcing and staff is really important, is you know, how do we keep, when we had thousands of um, healthcare workers across Australia quarantined for, as potential exposures, that put a lot of um, strain on health systems because we have a finite number of health workers and we need to manage that in terms of how they work, where they work and making sure that all our patients, whether they're COVID patients or not, get the care that they require. 
And then we manage workspaces to reduce transmission. And as I said, that's quite difficult, particularly in modern hospitals where there's limited space. Things like tea rooms became a problem because that's where staff were mingling and potentially spreading COVID um, because we didn't have enough of them to separate them out. And we still don't today, but, and a number of health services are putting up, um, you know, uh, container type um, spaces outside where people can have their breaks and get away from the ward safely and have a break. So the effective and consistent IPC, so we need to have staff training. Um, and one of the main things that we have learnt is particularly environmental cleaning and how we clean in hospitals. In, a, in many large health services, environmental cleaning is outsourced um, to contractors. And that has proved difficult to ensure that they have the adequate training. And when there has been a problem identified, getting that rectified. And I suspect that we'll see in the future um, that environmental cleaning services and, and even security services will be brought back into health services to help manage that in, in, in the future. In terms of healthcare worker priorities, we need to make sure we train our healthcare workers and provide some monitoring of compliance about what they're actually doing. And if they do need to improve, have a mechanism for doing that. And one of the things we found is the, the use of PPE, putting it on, taking it off, uh, needs to be done more consistently. We need to have staff ratios. One of the things in aged care that we noticed was that in the state aged care facilities, um, in Victoria, they had better outcomes because of the number of staff that they had there. Am I running out of time, Amanda? There you are, Matt. <laughs> okay, okay. That's fine, I can end up here. That's, that's, I'll just do, go I'll slip through to my last slide. Yeah, so one right. of the things that we look at is that not all, not all things that we do is good for everybody. And some of the work that I've been involved in has been around the Southeast Asian region. So we put together some guidelines for how to manage this in settings where they don't have the resources that we have. So you can see here on the right hand uh, side of your screen, the uh, no soap, no running water. Well, yep, we, we put together some resources on how to do hand washing when you don't have um, you know, potable running, running water. So, yep, sorry, I seem to have run over time. I didn't hear the noise, um, but thank you. Oh, Matt, you're welcome. Thank you for a great presentation. So our next presentation is a team presentation by um, Sylvia Tavares and Nick Stevens. Sylvia is a lecturer in urban design and town planning at USC. As an urban designer with a background in architecture, urbanism and building and city science, Sylvia's research focus um, provides evidence to produce public open spaces that are thermally comfortable and promote the good health of users and the natural environments that surround them. Sylvia has worked in academia across Australia, New Zealand, Germany and Brazil and is a registered architect and urbanist in Brazil. Nick is a senior lecturer um, um, in urban design and town planning at USC. He's also the deputy director of the Centre for Human Factors and the Socio-Technical Systems, where he leads the land use planning and urban design research theme. Nick currently serves on the Planning Institute of Australia Organising Committee for the Sunshine Coast. And in 2018, Nick led a project that received the Planning Institute of Australia Queensland Award for Planning Excellence. Nick and Sylvia will be speaking on the post-pandemic urban design, exploring safety and resilience in public space. Thank you, Sylvia and Nick. Terrific. All right, thanks everybody and good evening. Um, look, uh, to, this evening I'd like to talk about some work that we've been doing about exploring safety and resilience in public space and uh, I hope that you find it interesting. So cities and their design have long been shaped by health and health crisis. So the sanitary squalor uh, and the poor health of people in the 19th century industrial revolution in England, in England was a catalyst for the Public Health Act in 1848 and city reform. In fact, the, the garden city movement that came from that uh, also emerged at the time, blending city and country together and arguably is still the way in which we desire to live today. Our master plan communities of the 21st century uh, reflect that. Um, even in thinking about the cholera outbreaks in New York in 1848, Frederick Law Olmsted vision for Central Park in New York was as the lungs of the city, a place where people could breathe free of fear. And he believed that green space was curative for people. Um, and today science confirms that access to green space and public space is necessary for our health. 
as our world becomes increasingly urbanised, access to quality public space is critical to human health. And in Australia, more than 90% of us live in urban areas. Um, public and outdoor recreational spaces are important health assets, and they offer significant contributions to social and community well-being, as well as, as well as our own physical and mental health. Currently, there's an emerging conversation around COVID-19 and public space. And in a recent article, it was said, as places we encounter other people in contact and connection occurs in open, democratic and inclusive yet unpredictable ways, we'll have to change as a result of pandemic and public space may not survive as we know it. So the research today will talk about and explore the opportunities for making public space safer and more accessible for community use under pandemic conditions. The way in which we do this is by taking a systems approach. We recognise that the idea of linear or cyclical planning approaches are insufficient uh, where we have such complexity. We need systems understandings. So thinking about cities as complex systems is not new, um, but it's still not done very well. And in, in the continued study of the parts in isolation offers very little opportunities for insight. So in cities, we struggle bringing together um, planning with architecture and transport, health, community development. All of these often occur um, in silos. And what we're endeavouring to do in our research is consider it and consider that complexity together. So when it comes to public space, in 2015, we developed a systems model of what equitable and inclusive and ideal public space may represent. Uh, it was a project that focused on the human users in the urban environment, and it was in collaboration with the Seven Senses Foundation. In part, it explored the design of public space to better support families um, with children on the autism spectrum. And indeed, it was developed to provide really a gold standard for equitable and accessible public spaces for all community users. So in today's world, we've been able to use that pre-COVID model as a base for running a series of studies looking at the impact of COVID on public space and the implications for community use. So the approach we use is called work domain analysis and it allows us to describe and analyze any complex system across five levels. And what I like about it is it's uncomplicated. Um, anyone can use it, you don't need any fancy software and you can apply it to pretty much anything. So across the five levels at the very top, you've got the functional purpose. Why does the system exist at all? For here, it's to have an inclusive and connected community. At the next level down, you have the values and priority measures. So how do we measure the success of those functions? Safety, comfort, connections to nature. In the middle, we have the purpose related functions. So these are the activities that the system needs to perform. Social interaction, protection from climate, and the bottom two levels are the resources within the system. So the processes around shelter, places to wait, and the physical objects, so chairs, benches, open spaces, and on. So what it does, it provides a simple but not simplistic representation of complexity and it allows the inclusion of all the elements. It reveals the interdependencies from those aspirational things at the very top to the resources that we have at the bottom. And then through a series of means ends links, we can think about the, high, the, the how, what and why interactions of the space. So a public space looks like this in the model. So don't be afraid of that. Um, it's intended to be representative of, of all public spaces and it is an ideal model. So inclusive and accessible in urban settings. We're not talking here about forests or national parks. We're talking about squares, civic spaces, local parks and all those sorts of things. So let's have a bit of a look at the relationships in the model and a little bit about, a little bit about how it works. So for example, these means ends relationships, if we're to take one node um, in the middle, and here we've got, say, provide protection from climate. If that is what, then the node above it tells us why we need that. We need that for maximizing connections to nature, physical comfort, actual safety. How do we get it? By providing areas to wait, by shelter, by shadow, by greenery and vegetation. And it's really um, as simple as that. But what it does do is it provides those interdependencies between the whole system. So what have we done? Um, so with that baseline, we've, we've, we've established three exploratory and cumulative studies, um, which are both currently accepted or under review in academic journals. Um, but now I'll hand over to Sylvia to take you a little bit through those. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the first study we did um, explored the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions on public space and the implication for community and individual health and well-being. So we identified which uh, of the functions in the middle row uh, of the public space seized and how it impacted the overall system performance. 
Building on this study, the second study uh, explored what we can learn from other types of disasters for the, desi for the design of public space. In particular, in particular we looked at um, cr the Christchurch earthquake disaster. And the third study used the model again to assess which elements of public space are impacted by the presence of the virus. And we then also inserted some of the design interventions from study two into the model to see if we could improve the resilience of the public space to still operate under the um, uh, pandemic conditions. So um, in the study one, uh, co uh, we considered which functions were impacted. We did this by reviewing the model and also considering existing public space. So we investigated if the functions existed or not in a yes or no manner. So we didn't look at the degree that, is, um, that they might be impacted, but if they were there or not. The simulation showed that 15 of the 25 functions were affected, and that corresponds to 60% of the functions of public space. So for example, the functions relating to sensory experience were all impacted. That's related to touch, smell, sight, and hearing. Also functions of public space, which offered local character, vibrancy, diversity, and fun and adventure were restricted. But perhaps most significantly, the activities associated with people interacting with each other were uh, prevented. So all the places for meeting and waiting and social interaction um, cease to, to function. So the important outcome of this study is that the model helps us to establish uh, the impact of limiting activity and how this degrades the capacity of the overall intent for public space at the top of the model. In many ways, we already knew this to be true. Um, and individuals and communities craved the activities that public space afforded them, uh, which were suddenly no longer possible. However, what the system, uh, mo the system systems model in part reveals is how the limits um, of those activities resulted in us feeling individually and collectively less happy uh, and healthy and without this um, important urban space to share, often less connected as a community. Uh, the issue with a situation or a disaster like this, like what we are living uh, through, um, is that we are accommodating ourselves and getting used to this new reality. There's a risk that some of the needed change may not actually happen. So some researchers have defined the pandemic as a fast disaster if compared to climate change. But if we compare it to an earthquake, for example, it's actually a slow disaster, as it allows for that accommodation of a new normal, which is not pleasant, but it's manageable. In that regard, if we consider climate change, what we see in the map on the left uh, is what came to be known as the red zone in Christchurch following the 2011 earthquake. The red zone is an area that can't be built anymore due to the conditions of the soil and the risk of flood um, uh, as some of the land sank in that region. Uh, on, the, on the map on the right, uh, you can see the 100 year prediction for flooding, which uh, is exactly the same area. So that 100 year prediction happened after 10 seconds of earthquake. Um, and so if we think about the temporality of these events, the earthquake is a very fast disaster, COVID is a medium disaster and climate change is a slow disaster. And the slower the disaster is, the more space we have to choose not to act. Um, so what can we take for the future here? What can we learn? Our questions for this study were then, um, if we prioritize safety in the design of public space as was needed in Christchurch, uh, would it be possible to have spaces that better perform in the event of a new disease outbreak? And are there any new dimensions of public space that need to be considered so these spaces better perform if a new disease outbreak happens? Uh, our research developed soon after the earthquake had identified five urban design interventions as contributors to the restoration of community confidence and safety. Um, these five elements were first urban retreat and personal space. So these are spaces that allow people to have a space for themselves. So more personal space, they go in, uh, alone or in small groups. The environmental comfort in terms of thermal comfort and relationship with weather and climate becomes more important uh, because the relationship with the place itself is more important than in social spaces. There's a need to optimize the ability to enter and leave these spaces in an earthquake is because if an earthquake happens, we have to run and get out of the space, but also in a pandemic is this ability to avoid crossing by other people. Protection against built structures again in the earthquake was about 
um, structures that could collapse, but in, an, in a pandemic is about the ability of not touching things or operating in that space without um, this physical contact. And maximizing soft landscape um, is related to the ability of coordinating mov movement of people in those spaces and also in um, retreat spaces, the ability of making those spaces look a little bit busier instead of an empty area so the vegetation can help in that regard. Uh, in the third study, uh, we explored the opportunities for making public space safer and more accessible for community um, under the pandemic conditions by introducing those five post-earthquake design interventions. So the current pandemic has, hi um, has highlighted the adaptive capacity of public spaces, and this study allows for more detailed explorations of this adaptation through a systems approach. The aim was to identify the availability of the elements of the system in the presence of the virus. So here we reviewed the entire model from the top to the bottom as a traffic like life systems of coding um, to, to understand um, what was actually and how the system was impacted. So red um, means that the node would be completely unavailable to the system. Yellow means that the node still is still available, but the performance is reduced. And green means that the node um, is unaffected and still works as a, in a pre-pandemic situation. So the results show that there were surprisingly few nodes that were completely unavailable to the system, only 16 out of 142, which, is, which corresponds to around um, 12%. Uh, examples of nodes that were completely unavailable were things like community and civic functions, drinking fountains, playground equipment, uh, tables and chairs. And in fact, across the function, um, the function purpose and values at the top, none of the elements were completely unavailable. Um, and also none of them were completely unaffected. Uh, they were still available to the system, but in a reduced performance. It was mainly the physical objects and their associated process that were unaffected. And this is related to the three identified groups exist, uh, uh, of existing hard infrastructure, natural elements, um, and those associated with objects that um, actually uh, help the public space to function. So they are things like infrastructure, um, and not necessarily trees and, and things like that, but not necessarily the spaces where we interact. So uh, building on a post-COVID model, next one, um, the integration of the urban interventions were all identified as helping to optimize the adaptive capacity of these public spaces. And to finish up, uh, I'd just like to point out some key insights. Um, one is that cooperation is required to these new social norms. Uh, and we require individuals to be aware of these so spatial relationships with others and their surroundings. Um, the function separation, the, the function of separation in public space is essential, and it contradicts what we has we have always been doing, and which is one of the key things of urbanism and urban design, which is to produce the social spaces. Um, it then requires a shift in thinking and being able to produce and to, to plan these spaces where we are to get together, but somehow apart. In fact, the current design that um, of many public spaces that is only focused on social space, it actually is, it excludes some of the groups in society that might not want to participate in that vibrant urban environment. So a more balanced design that embraces all needs is needed. Uh, another thing that is also apparent is the high level of resilience um, that already exists in public in the public space system, uh, and have uh, we have all seen that the use of an excess of public space uh, by the community has taken new significance under the pandemic. The context, um, type, and form of public space matters. For example, large open space and green space and parks. Um, which permit distancing, they are still important and they are self-organizing sp spaces, but in a more urbanized area where we have more density, uh, small spaces uh, are also needed and they can allow people to be together but apart. So these are really the um, uh, retreat spaces. The insertion of these five urban design interventions identified in the post-earthquake context have significantly improved the adaptive capacity of the spaces. Um, and this is also a consequence of us as human assets helping to shape these public spaces. Uh, and finally, further testing uh, the design interventions in industry, in industry workshops on design outcomes uh, is the next step for, for this project. 
So this more detailed design exploration can review the spatial relationships uh, within this public spaces. Public space is necessary um, as a health and community infrastructure and through a systems approach, we may be able to begin to establish ways of ensuring that they are available under all conditions, including a pandemic. So thank you very much. That's our presentation. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, and it's, it's always very difficult to actually um, to be able to put so much research into such a tight time frame. So thank you again. Uh, just before we move on to um, our final presentation tonight, could I remind um, everybody just to post the questions um, for the presenters? And this can be done using the Q&A function. So our final pres presenter tonight is um, by Ipek Buch, and uh, Ipek is a senior lecturer in environmental microbiology at USC. She's worked in the field of biodiscovery since 1982 and has held prestigious international fellowships with the Italian National Council, Research Council, NATO Double Jump Program and the British Councils. Her areas of expertise include applied industrial and environmental microbiology, biotechnology and marine biology. Uh, she serves as a current president for the World Federation for Culture Collections. And tonight, IPEX is going to talk to us on creating COVID safe environments through literacy in microbiology. Thank you, IPEX. Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you, Amanda. And it's great to be part of this very exciting forum. I would like to start with the history of microbiology, microorganisms. It goes back long before us, our existence, you know, uh, 3.5 billion years ago. You know, we can see the first early evidence of the existence of microorganisms. And then you can see, you know, how it diversified coming to days, you know, like fungi. It's also in this category. So, we know, we started seeing microorganisms in 16... Um, 74. So our knowledge is very limited. It's less than 400 years about microorganisms compared to 3.5 billion years. And uh, if we look at the microorganisms, they all come from a same universal ancestor. And there are three different lines, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Archaea, when I was a university student in the 70s, we didn't know about archaea. It was discovered in 1982. And those microorganisms, those type of bacteria, they live in extreme environments, which is similar to early Earth. You know, in the early days of Earth, conditions were very harsh. So those microbes adapted to those conditions and they stayed to live in those environments like Yellowstone National Park in the USA. So we can see bacteria, archaea, and fungi easily once they grow. But viruses, they can only be seen using the electron microscopy, and they require a host to survive. They themselves cannot survive. So if you look at the first diagram, you wouldn't see the viruses because they are in a different category. They need one of these organisms or higher organisms to be able to survive. And if you look at it here on the right, their size, poliovirus, which caused lots of devastation, how small compared to the human red blood cell or E. coli bacteria. Okay, then if we look at the examples of key pathogenic microorganisms throughout the centuries, we know the Black Death and then tuberculosis. And then they were both caused by bacteria, two different bacteria. And tuberculosis reached to a stage that people could not even cope with the disease and they made it, they romanticized, they wrote, you know, novels about it, love stories, music about tuberculosis, dying of your love type of thing. So ex um, the damage was so extensive. And then we had polio, which was caused by virus. And most of you in Australia have Irish uh, grandparents and uh, former generations coming from Ireland due to this, you know, for me. And uh, in all these, you know, um, pandemics, there were two key aspects we learned. What was that? Public health and safety and management, a simple hand wash, 
or the discovery of um, disinfectants like Joseph Lister. The Listerine we use to gargle comes after him, his name, and he made the first efforts to design antiseptics. And then the second one is very important. We identify and preserve these disease-causing microorganisms, like the ones for smallpox. A few years ago, there was an attempt to destroy the last uh, samples of these uh, uh, disease-causing microorganism virus, and it was stopped. You know, it is very important that we have the examples of these microorganisms. So when we encounter their derivatives in the future, we can have some preventative measures. So from tuberculosis to now, what has changed? Nothing, very little because we still resort to basic measures like hygiene and isolation. In the 60s, for example, I remember in my childhood, all these, you know, posters do not spit. It was very important, you know, it was the people would be treated like they have leprosy and similar if they spit. And now like smoking now. So you can see here, we are still doing the same things, hand washing and isolation. So there are different groups of microorganisms, risk group one, two, three, and four. And for example, Ebola virus is in category four. So you might see on television and the scientists wearing the space suits. That's the reason, because no treatments or vaccines, vaccines exist for these kind of diseases. And if you look at the microorganisms here, and the spores of uh, uh, microorganisms to viruses with lipids from most resistant to least resistant. We are very lucky at the moment because coronavirus is in this category, least resistant, compared to the tuberculosis bac micro bacterium, like mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that's why they tell us keep washing your hands. All these, you know, uh, disinfectants and soap they can dissolve this fatty layer outside the virus. So we can get rid of this virus easily if we attend all these you know, recommendations. Unfortunately, this virus survives on lots of different you know, uh, surfaces and we have to be extremely careful. And even money, paper money, uh, one of the presenter uh, also mentioned earlier, uh, that's why China uh, printed new banknotes during the pandemic. They got rid of all the paper money in China and they produced new ones. So also with masks, you know, we have to be extremely careful how we handle our mask and how we touch it. Here is, if you, say, if you see, you know, if we touch it, we have to wash our hands immediately again. So even I was watching the you know, press release by President Trump's doctor, personal uh, doctor, and when he came out to give the press uh, release, he also did the wrong thing. He removed his mask and then put it into his pocket. So if there was a virus, he contaminated his own you know, pocket. And there are fomites, you know, fomites are contaminated objects and surfaces. They can help the transmission of microorganisms. So in the supermarkets, that's why we have to be extremely careful. Trolleys are the public animal number one, and we haven't been doing the right thing with trolleys. After the COVID situation, attention was given to trolleys, but it is a little bit too late. We shouldn't put, you know, all these um, uh, vegetables without any uh, plastic bags uh, together with the meat. At the same time, we put our child in the trolley who might visit the public toilet a few minutes earlier. Apparently, the SARS virus survived 28 days in the refrigerator. So there are entry points of microorganisms into our body from nasal, oral, skin, gastrointestinal, and urogenital. So we have to be extremely careful, you know, uh, in these areas uh, with the hygiene, so we do not get microorganisms inside. And these droplets, you know, for example, in the fomite droplets spread on surfaces and also flying around, 
you can see the size compared to the uh, micron human hair and then look at our alveoli. So they can easily go through our uh, breathing system, reaching the depths of our uh, lungs. And uh, pre-COVID situation was really disastrous. I gave a press release and uh, it was included in the university website. And hygiene was very poor. I was noticing in the airplanes and I was feeling really very concerned. And the blankets, for example, uh, they should be only opened, you know, for a single person. They shouldn't be repeatedly used. Now they all wake up, woke up and they are cleaning the airplanes extensively. And the future airplane design will be, you know, can be irradiated and then panels between passengers. And there will be, you know, extreme measures to prevent the uh, dissemination. So animal vectors and pathogens uh, can be transmitted through animal vectors. You can see in this diagram, uh, when we bring our pet from our, uh, outside, how the microorganisms are <laughs> spreading out from our pets. And um, safety of public drinking water fountains is really very a uh, prime uh, concern. It's imperative that we, uh, we adhere to hygienic conditions we shouldn't be washing and our pets there. You can see here, children are coming and drinking after that. So in the avian flu case, you can see three different uh, wild uh, birds, quail, goose, and teal. The viruses from there, they merge. They pr produce the avian flu virus, and then it jumped to chicken and then the human beings. So we have to continuously map the pathogens uh, in this uh, wildlife and uh, bats and similar and we should stop wild animal trade and then eating consuming them there is also uh, permafrost uh, defrosting so uh, new uh, uh, pathogens are coming for example seal finger anthrax are emerging in this defrosting environment and some people are infected and even dying and we have also superbugs continuously. Microorganisms are living entities. They develop mechanisms to combat the, whatever we give to them, antibiotics, disinfectants. So even a simple finger cut could be fatal. We go back to the days before the penicillin. So here also we experience, for example, forming events because microorganisms come and try to break down the um, um, pollutants, so no dumping, no car washing, you know, be aware that everything you do goes to DuPont Avenue, then cotton tree, then circulating around. We have to be extremely careful with what we do. So now Stone Age, Golden Age, Space Age garbage, and look at this, my feast for microorganism in the environment. So I think we might just need to move along. Hmm. No, just nearly run out of time. <laughs> Please take your rubbish home. Okay. So our survival, like the penicillin, which saved the world, and extinction, like greenhouse gases, the production coming from microbial activities, or emergence of superbugs, of uh, the mankind will be decided by microorganisms. So please take microorganisms seriously. And you might see here the latest uh, publication by lots of eminent uh, microbiologists in Europe and other parts of the world, including Australia. We urgently need literacy in microbiology in society so we can stop future, you know, pandemics, epidemics. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I think when we listen to your presentation, uh, it reinforces all the things that we should be doing at a personal level with hygiene and 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 how we should be managing space, I think, um, in the COVID environment. So I think we could go to a Q&A session now. And I have a first question, if I could just ask all the speakers to turn on their videos. Um, and uh, Ipek, if you could just stop the screen share, that would be great. 
So Matt, I have the first question for you. Um, and the question relates to PPE. It seems to be important for preventing virus transmission in healthcare, and you were very clear about that in your presentation. But why are there differences in the equipment we see workers using for protection in Australia and overseas? Um, <clears throat> well, it comes down to a couple of things. Um, the, the guidelines that you're working under and we have some World Health Organisation guidelines, but you know countries like to do their own thing. And also the different there's also differences, you know, even here in Australia between different states. But I think what we've seen, particularly in um, Southeast Asian countries, is much more acceptance and and um, practice with high level PPE use. So the coveralls coal head covering um, respirators than there are in, say, Western countries like Australia and, and the USA. And so we tend to um, <coughs> not use those as, as, as commonly because there, there's risk to healthcare workers in donning and doffing, so putting on and taking off um, that level of PPE that is greater than the risk of um, COVID with using a lower level um, PPE in Australia, because in Australia, we don't have the same level of community spread and the number of cases and therefore the exposures of healthcare workers that you might in, an, in a country where there's a lot more exposure. So the, the, the guidelines on what we use change. You're muted, Amanda. There you go, sorry. Um, so following on from that, um, is there any new research on mask uh, efficiency? And um, some countries, I suppose, have had a high uptake of mask wearing, um, but others probably haven't. So what would be your comment on that? Um, I'm just going to share a screen because I've got a slide that talks You do to know me. you have limited time. I here. do have a very limited time. <laughs> I understand that. But I think this makes it, this actually will answer the question quite well. Good. So one of the things is there's not really new um, guidelines on, on masks. but and, and yes, there are countries with um, masks that don't, that have a lot of spread. But this Swiss cheese model here that we, that we have, it's not about one thing. Masks by themselves won't work. You need to do everything else. So it's all well and good if you're wearing a mask, but if you use that mask and you have it hanging around your neck um, or you use it day in, day out and you touch everything and you don't do hand hygiene or you don't do you know, some physical distancing, then the, the, the use of the mask becomes less and less um, useful. It's one of many things. And I think that's where we're seeing some of the issues um, is that people are saying the mask will save me so I don't need to do the other things. I don't need to wash my hands. I don't need to not go to work when I'm sick. Um, I can have 30 people over to my house and have a bit of, bit of a rave because we're in our house and take the masks off because we're inside and it's all my friends. And that's where we're getting the problems. It's not, it's not the issue with the mask. Thanks, Matt. So, Ipek, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned microbial resistance. Are there any other potential um, downsides to using too much cleaning and sanitising? Yes, of course. The more we use, we encourage microorganisms to develop resistance. Like I told uh, before, survival of the fittest. They are also <coughs> and they are trying to survive. So they find mechanisms to combat with all these different types of chemicals we give them. They have really impressive uh, mechanisms to make them useless, like they did with the penicillin. Thank you. Uh, Nick, a question for you. Um, so what are the key considerations for design of the different types of public spaces? For example, large parks versus small parks. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question too. Um, and it, and it's certainly true that the context of the environment will matter, the kind of space that you're trying to deal with. So for those kinds of parks that are large open green space parks like we have here on the Sunshine Coast, they're already fairly flexible. So to a large extent, they're already quite adaptive. You know, people can move through them and avoid each other quite well. Um, um, it'll be about the placement of playgrounds and shelters that still remain, leave plenty of room to move. Um, but I think where the challenge is, is some of those more 
um, discrete and intimate kind of inner city um, public spaces. And there we'll need more detailed design guidance. We'll have to pay real attention to, you know, how people use them, where people enter them, the flow of people through them, um, you know, seating arrangements um, and all of those sorts of things as well. So it's true that the, the type of public space will have a big, uh, a, bit, a lot to say on the kind of response that we make. Thanks, Nick. Sylvia, could you say just a little bit more on um, your next steps uh, with the research that's been presented by yourself and Nick tonight? Sure. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, every time we present this research, uh, the question that we get is, so what, how we design this public spaces and how is it going to look like? And, you know, now that you know all these things that you have to insert in the model, how do they look like? So that is the next step is, um, we are going to now uh, investigate how these five elements um, that have proven to increase the resilience in crisis post earthquake, how they could materialize um, contextually uh, here in the Sunshine Coast, and then how they would then improve the performance of the system in a pandemic um, situation. So that's the next thing we're going to do is how to is, is try to, to make this uh, a 3D a visual visualization something that we can visualize and live visualize and living yeah thank you so we're nearly at the end of our time so could i get um a wrap-up statement from everybody um regarding the key message they'd like taken home from their presentation today so matt did you want to have the first yeah, statement I can say so stay, yeah i think infection prevention and control is not just for clinical health workers it is for everyone we need all need to do our bit hand hygiene physical distancing and and looking after ourselves and we need to make a community where it is okay for people to do that and where where people with insecure work can take time off if they're sick and that's a community responsibility nick your your final statement uh, yeah, not not dissimilar, actually. And it's this idea that we need to cooperate. And even in public spaces and the ways in which we move through the environment, um, you know, there's an element of teamwork required in the way in which we engage with each other in public space. And that's kind of new. Um, and it'll be cooperation and teamwork and working together to make sure that we all remain safe. Thanks. Sylvia? Yeah, I think um, there's a, this idea, this resistance that we we feel every time we talk about the retreat spaces and being together but apart. Uh, the, this idea that public spaces are for people to socialize. This is what we do, um, and I think you know historically we have been excluding some groups, and we talk about gender equality and all that, but not everyone wants the same thing. So I think it's quite important that we acknowledge that by by solving that problem, we are also creating more resilient places um, for situations like what we are living in. One other thing is the climate. It's quite important for that, those spaces to function and to keep them safe. As, as Matt mentioned, you know, ventilation is important uh, and to have vent good ventilation is in buildings, you need very good urban spaces as well to channel those breezes. So I think it's, a, it's another part of the system is to consider the type of space and the climate in them. Thanks, Sylvia. And Epic, you've got the final statement for the evening. I fully agree with the three previous speakers with me. Yes, uh, education, understanding, helping the authorities, and hand in hand, you know, we will overcome the epidemic. And from urban design to nursing, all of them very important disciplines, and it will be a multidisciplinary approach with the support from public. Thank you so much. And that concludes our, our, webinar, our webinar for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us.